Well, good morning, AEMC family. Um, as you may have heard uh, by now, no doubt you have, uh, Premier Ford has uh, given the green light for uh, public worship services to resume at 30% capacity, and we will be offering a modified worship service on Sunday, and uh, you will probably have read the email by now, so I won't go into that. I was um, rather amused uh, by a cartoon I received some months back, um, and it's a picture of a lady with disheveled hair wearing her nightgown, uh, fuzzy bunny slippers with a cup of coffee in hand, walking up the center aisle of, of a church sanctuary, and the caption reads, Mrs. Jones got a little too used to watching online worship from home. But seriously, in this uh, time, what, what has this time apart been like for you? For some of you, you will continue to stay apart uh, for appropriate and good reasons, and we honor and respect that. But what has this time apart been like for you? As I've thought about uh, this situation that we've found ourselves in, in the, for the last three months, I, I got to thinking about... Israel's greatest national tragedy, short of the destruction of the temple in AD 70, and it was in 586 BC, uh, the time when King Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the city, um, destroyed the temple, killed a lot of people, and carried off thousands into exile. In Babylon, Israel's, I would say, second greatest national tragedy uh, in biblical times, the exile to Babylon. And, um, you know, uh, this whole idea of, of exile uh, seems to me to be a, a very poignant metaphor uh, for what we have been going through. And, and I'm very interested in the way that Israel coped with the situation in terms of prior to the exile. We read in Jeremiah people that uh, are being told by the Lord, uh, amend your ways and your doings and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They said exile and destruction, it wouldn't happen. And of course, today we have Christians who uh, have continued against the best advice of our leaders in government and in the medical field and scientists who have continued to go to services claiming they are safe because why they're covered with the blood of Jesus. Um, N.T. Wright who has written a book called God and the Pandemic, which you can get on Kindle for the low, low price of $6.77, um, says in the book, a very short book, only 80-some pages, he says, I am appalled by reports of would-be devout but misguided people ignoring safety regulations because they believe that as Christians they are automatically protected against disease or that, as I heard someone say on television, you'll be safe inside church because the devil can't get in there. I wanted to say, trust me, lady, I'm a bishop. The devil knows his way in there as well as anybody else. This is the kind of superstition that gives Christians a bad name. <laughs> and uh, back in the, in the day, prior to the 586 exile, uh, this can't happen. This won't happen because, hey, we're, we're God's people, and this is the temple. God would never let it be destroyed. Again, ahead of the exile, a prophet Habakkuk, is crying out to God for justice, as many people are doing today in the streets. We have a situation which is not just the pandemic, the disease, but, but the pandemic of racism and all of the sad things that have occurred in these last uh, number of weeks in particular that have become a flashpoint. And uh, Habakkuk says, 
O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. And the Lord's shocking answer to Habakkuk is this, look at the nations and see, be astonished, be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told, but I'm telling you, I am rousing the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, that fierce and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own, dread and fearsome are they, their justice and dignity, get this, proceed from themselves. They are a law unto themselves, and they are powerful enough to make that law stick. They will do what they want to do, and actually, for a season, I'm going to let them. And Habakkuk's response he says, are you not from of old, O Lord my God, my Holy One? You shall not die, or many translations, we shall not die. Actually, I think you shall not die uh, makes great sense. As long as you are alive, this kind of thing could never happen because your eyes are too pure to behold evil. You can't look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they. There is no way. Habakkuk makes the case for why destruction and exile at the hands of Babylon cannot and could not happen, but it did happen. And Israel actually was left in no doubt as to why. And there are many passages that assign the why. I'm entitling this message, Going Into Exile. And I say this, this series uses the metaphor of exile to try and make sense of what is happening to us because of COVID-19. I mean, think about it. What have you had to cope with or suffer as a result? One of the things that we've all had to cope with is, is the fact that the church, up to this coming Sunday, has left the building after our last gathering together on March 15th, uh, we and, in fact, all churches in Ontario were, were required to leave our buildings, and with good reason. And again, I ask, how has this affected you? How has this affected you? Uh, there is the, the picture of, uh, of the, the title page of um, Tom Wright's book, um, and uh, right, him, it does um, write uh, on the metaphor of exile, and I want to assure you that I had prepared this run of messages, this series, before I read this, and it was, it was nice affirmation coming from uh, a scholar of, of his uh, stature, but he talks about recognizing the present moment as a time of exile. He writes, We find ourselves by the waters of Babylon, thoroughly confused and grieving for the loss of our normal life. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, as in Psalm 137, which will be, um, by the way, a major part of what uh, I will look at next, next weekend. But this translates quite easily into, for us, how can I know the joy of the Eucharist or communion sitting in front of a computer? Or how can I celebrate Ascension or Pentecost or Easter without being with my brothers and my sisters? And it's, it's felt like, quite honestly, a time akin to exile. The church left the building. And I ask you, what, what losses have you experienced? What discouragement, maybe depression, loneliness, questions 
unresolved. Why is this exile happening and how do we respond to it as those indeed who are covered by the blood of Jesus, so to speak? What questions have we been asking? Should we be asking? And in the asking, are we being challenged and changed by the sort of questions we ask? Changed for better or possibly for worse, depending on the sorts of questions and conclusions that you may uh, have considered arriving at in this time. And so today I, I, I want to raise two questions for our consideration. Why is this happening? And who or what should we blame? I mean, as, as we think about the situation, is, is God punishing sin in general or some sin in particular? We'll come back to John 9 in a little bit. But is that what's happening? Is this God's direct response to sin and perhaps specific sin? And if so, what sin? Or is this happening because, in the words of Romans 1, God has given us over to the consequences then of our sin, of our rebellion, of our idolatry, of our not thinking it worthwhile to retain God in his thinking, in our thinking, and in our living, even though he has revealed himself in so many uh, ways through his creation and through his word, and yet we have been less than positively responsive. And so is this part of God's response of giving us over, taking his hands off, so to speak, to allow us to suffer the consequences of our sin. And of course, in such a situation, the really guilty are getting it, but so are those who honestly haven't done anything or who are faithful to God. And, and so there's a question. Is, is that how we should be thinking of this? Or, you know, to be very practical and uh, down to earth, should we blame China? It's been called the China virus by some high up in uh, the administration to the south of us. Um, it was suggested without any evidence presented that this, this virus got out due to uh, uh, either deliberate or unintentional um, difficulties at a particular infectious disease lab, or maybe it was the wet markets, but should we blame China? Or maybe what some have considered American indifference initially, followed by incompetence as things moved on, and not everyone would, would concur with that, but, but we've, we've got to ask the question, or maybe we don't have to, about who, sh who we should blame, or maybe it's 5G, uh, the suggestion that 5G is responsible for unleashing a virus has led uh, very misguided people to try to burn down or in some other fashion destroy uh, cell towers. Um, the kind of questions we ask and the conclusions that we come to have consequences. Perhaps we should ask this question, does Scripture itself support attaching blame in every situation where something goes very badly? Does Scripture assign blame? For example, and this was brought up to Jesus in Luke uh, chapter 13, where he was asked to respond to the question of whether certain people that Pilate brutally murdered or those upon whom a tower fell were worse sinners than the average John Smith or Jane Doe. And Jesus' response is quite instructive on that. Check out Luke 13 to see what I'm talking about. Does Scripture attach blame for the, the fact that Israel found itself in captivity in Egypt, for another example. 
And, and, and so, you know, that's a question that we have to consider as we try to wrestle with this question of who or what should we blame? And should we be asking that at all? Two questions. The first, why is this happening to us or who should we blame? When you think about it, that really is, in the end, a futile pursuit. God has not revealed to us why this is happening. And in the absence of some sure word from God, there are plenty of people who are quite happy to fill in that gap. But apart from a sure word from heaven, is this not really a futile pursuit? Perhaps there's a better question we should be asking. In light of it all, what should we do? And how can we help? And I suggest to you that this question has very fruitful possibilities attached to it. Consider Acts 11. It's a, just, a, just a very brief passage here toward the end of Acts 11 in which at that time prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine over all the world. Okay, so did they then, upon hearing this, ask the prophets a follow-up question? So, guys, whose fault is this? Who's to blame? Did they do that? Perhaps this, this extra bit that I haven't read, and this took place during the reign of Claudius. Maybe there's a veiled accusation against Claudius. He was the emperor, after all, who... Uh, we read later in Acts, expelled the Jews from Rome. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila were of that group, and they encountered Paul subsequent to that. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some blame attached to Rome, specifically Claudius, but we're not told that. And anyway, this, this, this group of believers in Antioch did not even raise the question of blame. Rather, it was more along the lines of, well, how can we help? What can we do to alleviate the situation, to mitigate the consequences, to alleviate the suffering? And so we read that the disciples determined that according to their ability, each would send relief to the believers living in Judea. Believers that were less well off than they, and indeed vulnerable to um, greater negative effects because of this famine. And, and this they did by sending it to the elders, by Barnabas and Saul. Their question was not, whose fault is this and who can we blame, but how can we help? What can we do? And don't you think that in, in a time like this, that is such a, a, a more properly Christ-like response to what we're all facing at this time. And folks, it's not over. It's not over. Yes, we are beginning some reopening with some protocols in place that uh, you, I hope, will have read uh, and, and that we will follow as those of you who choose to be present on Sundays going forward uh, will follow and honor uh, so that we keep uh, one another safe and healthy to the best of our ability. But, but now, going back to this question of blame, let, let's, let's just deal with that and get that uh, buried for good. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And what was Jesus' answer? Nobody. Nobody sinned. Not in a direct cause and effect sense. Not this man, not his parents. Rather, he was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And Jesus urges his disciples here not to look back to try to figure out whose fault this thing was, or to explain it. Oh, how we want answers. We want to be able to explain anything, everything. And we don't have the capacity 
to do that, but, but Jesus pointed them ahead. He said, he said, look ahead to what God is doing and is going to do in the life of this man and those he influences. Who sinned? Nobody. Fast forward to Lazarus. Master, the man you love is ill. And when Jesus got the message, he said, well, serves him right. If you knew what I know about Lazarus, and I know all things, you'd know he was getting his just desserts. No, that's not what Jesus says. That's not our Lord and Savior Jesus at all. No, he says, look ahead. Look ahead. It's all about the glory of God. This illness will not lead to death. It's all about the glory of God, and the Son of God will be glorified through it. Look ahead to see how God's glory will reveal itself in Lazarus's life and experience and ongoing witness. The glory of God is going to be revealed. He didn't sin. <laughs> in a specific cause and effect way, and God's glory, and later at the tomb, take away the stone. No, master, he's, he's been dead four days. It'll smell. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see God's glory? I rest my case. I rest my case. Think of another uh, situation where... Um, Blame was not attached, although one could possibly think of it in relation to the famine that um, brought Israel uh, to, to, into Egypt, Joseph being uh, taken there against his will because of his brother's jealousy against him, and their murderous intentions, and they decided to sell him as a slave. And in and through that situation, God just does a marvelous, marvelous work of, of elevating Joseph to number two in all of the land. And after Jacob's death, Joseph's brothers started to freak out. What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? And, and they approached Joseph and they said, uh, Joseph, uh, your father gave instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. And, and please do this, Joseph. And we read that Joseph wept. When they spoke to him and he said, am I in the place of God? Don't be afraid, even though you intended to do harm to me. God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. This is amazing grace that is greater than any sin. And here we see God's wise purpose and providence at work to save lives. God is always looking ahead and preparing us for the work that he has for us ahead if we will just track with him, love him, serve him, honor him, as did Joseph. And regardless of any sin involved, sin's been dealt with. So, so let me ask, in, in closing today, three questions. Where are you witnessing the works of God, the wisdom of God, the glory of God in the midst of this exile, which is, as I said, not yet over, although our situation is changing? Where have you seen and are seeing God's works, God's wisdom, God's glory in your life or those that you know and have witnessed? Where are you seeing it? And what opportunities have you found to offer support and assistance? Or what help have you received that you are so thankful to God for? What opportunities are we seeing? Because you see, folks, the church 
has left the building for such a time as this. In fact, most of the time, the church is not in the building, but in the community, at home, at work, at school, when it's open. And where are you seeing opportunities? And where are you pitching in to help? There, there is a concrete case. Uh, I'll just share it with you. We have uh, now in our neck of the woods, Ray and Gloria Klestra, a, a retired pastor from uh, Mindamoya Church in, uh, in Manitoulin Island. And when they moved in uh, a number of weeks ago, uh, Phil and Sawyer uh, were on hand to lend some assistance. And... Uh, uh, and uh, I say to them, thank you for that. It's just an example of how uh, we can find ways to, to offer support and assistance in such a time as this. But i got to ask this last question. Is, is any of this simply cut and dried? Folks, the last thing we need is a cold and analytical assessment of what's happening Yes, assess, but we need people of compassion and empathy, of deep sympathy and feeling. We need this from our leaders as well as generally. This is a time for deep corporate sorrow and concern and compassion because, folks, exile is not painless. This has not been painless for you or for those who have appreciated and received your help. I mean, think about it. The blind man Jesus healed was excommunicated from the synagogue. Jesus wept profusely prior to raising Lazarus, so deeply aware and even angry at what death, the last enemy, was doing to his friends, and, the, and he wept for them and with them, even knowing what he was going to do. That is our God, a God of compassion, a God of deep emotion and empathy who moves powerfully on our behalf and not just coldly, in, uh, analytically, uh, and just shows of raw power. That's not our God. And look, with regard to the famine of Acts 11, people were hungry and dying, and no doubt did. And, and in the situation we have today with COVID, people are hungry and dying. Some families, many families, it's been uh, indicated, do not have sufficient food to feed their families. Healthcare workers have gotten COVID-19. Exile is Painful. One of our own pastors in, in our denomination, Jay Chaudhry, was in hospital for 47 days and on a ventilator for several days. And uh, God has given him his life. They thought it was over. But exile is painful, which leads to the next message in this series, which is entitled, Grieving Our Exile. There is a time to grieve, and to lament. But in so doing, we do it with the full awareness and the plea, Lord, I need you. I need you every hour. I need you. You're my one defense. My righteousness, oh Lord. How I need you. Would you join me wherever you are in singing this powerful song to the Lord?
Oh God.